All right, well, thanks again for joining our session. Um, again, my name is Daniel Ku. I'm a senior director at FINRA, currently managing the development of DevOps products and engineering. So we have Chris and Lotha here. They're uh, working with my team. And um, we're going to talk about how we uh, develop uh, and deploy applications securely in AWS. So, you know, we have been in cloud migration journey for quite some time now. Um, it's been about three to four years that we've, we've spent time in developing our applications, deploying to AWS, and migrating over our applications that's been running in our data center to the cloud. And when we reflect back on what we have done, um, a lot of our time and energy was spent on making sure we have the right level of compliance and security built in. One of the big reasons, of course, is who we are, right, FINRA, we are a regulatory company. And when you look at the industry, there's a lot of news around security breach and you know, compliance related aspects. So we tried our best to make sure we have you know, security built in and compliance built in, right? And that's what we wanna talk about today. We wanna talk about three of our solutions that we've implemented that is helping with their secure development. So first, we wanna talk about how we encrypt AMIs and share across multiple accounts. And then we're going to talk about how we manage our security groups in AWS. And then we're also going to talk about how we manage our secrets in AWS. All right, so let's get started. So first, a quick introduction about FINRA. So FINRA stands for Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. We are a regulatory company overseeing the broker-dealer industry. Our mission is to protect investors and promote market integrity. So talking about some numbers about FINRA. <clears throat> so we monitor 12 different markets and exchanges. We regulate more than 3,800 different firms and more than 634,000 brokers that are working in the US. And on average, we collect 37 billion transactions. So on a day-to-day -day basis, that's how much we collect so we can analyze the data and see what's going on in our market. Um, so as I just mentioned, we collect a lot of data, right? Um, we can get up to 75 billion events. I believe recently we reached 100 billion transactions on a single day. So that's you know, a lot of data that we collect, right? And we also store a lot of data. We have more than 20 petabytes of data that we store in AWS. And when we replay our market data that we collect, it can get up to trillions of nodes and edges. So that shows the complexity of you know, the data that we collect and that we analyze. And every day, we will run hundreds of complex queries, again, to make sure that market is, is, is doing what it needs to do, <clears throat> and um, fraud detections, and any suspicious activities is what we try to catch in the data that we collect. At any given time, we could be having more than 5,000 running instances. And within our portfolio, we have more than 150 different applications that are deployed to run our business. So you know, in order for us to be successful and, and, and migrate over our applications to the cloud, we had to rely on cloud computing. We had to rely on big data technologies. And not only that, I think the biggest thing uh, besides you know, relying on the cloud computing and big data technologies, we had to change our culture. We had to change our mindset, the way we think. Right? So we start to look at, all right, how can we adopt DevOps? How can we implement DevOps? How can we implement continuous delivery within our organization to be more agile, right? automate everything from beginning to the end? So that's what my team focuses on, is, is building solutions to allow our development community to practice DevOps. We don't believe in having a separate DevOps team. Right? We believe in building the right tooling and building the right solutions for our development teams to consume to practice DevOps. So I want to talk a little bit about our DevOps practice. Um, typically, when projects teams start, whether that is migrating over their app to the cloud, or it's a greenfield app, they're starting from scratch, they go through an in inception phase, right? They start thinking about their app, 
what do they need to build, right? What are the requirements? How are we going to integrate with other systems, right? So they go through that phase. And after that, now they got to, you know, get off the ground, right? That's the kickstart phase, right? Where they're going to start thinking about their code and their architecture. Now, in the traditional world, you know, before we went to the cloud, we had a separate ops team that would maintain the infrastructure, right? Get everything ready. Here's a server. Here's all the things that's you know, installed on these servers. And then the dev team will say, well, my software is ready. Please deploy. Now, that's, that has completely changed when we started moving to the cloud. We start to think about the team start to think about infrastructure as well as their application. So the code that they need to be uh, thinking about, again, is infrastructure code and application code. So that's the Kickstarter phase. How do they get started, right? And after that, now once they get going, they go through a development and testing cycle, right? They start developing their code, they test, they integrate with other systems, and then once they feel comfortable and when they're ready, they release to production for users to consume, and then now we're continuously monitoring the application, right, for their health. So what are we trying to achieve, right? What are we trying to achieve in each of these phases? These are the goals that we, we target. Standardization, compliance, integrating security from the beginning, right? It's not the after fact, it's from the beginning, right? Integrating ops from the beginning, as well as following some architecture patterns, and also automating all the way through from the beginning to the end, making it self-service for teams to practice DevOps. Those are our goals. So how are we achieving these goals within uh, these tools? Now, what you see on the screen, th this is a subset of the tools that we use. It's a combination of custom tools that we built, uh, open source uh, tools, and SaaS-based tools, as well as the license tools, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the security elements within these tools. So in the inception phase, the onboard, that's a tool that we created that allows development teams to get started um, with their access to the systems, right? So it sets up AD groups, it sets up IAM roles, and all the different accounts, and pretty much sets up all the things you need to start your development. It creates your um, code repos, Jira projects, and everything that's needed for you to get started. Portus, which is an application, another custom application that we built, which we're going to talk about today, is used to manage security groups. Right? Provision is a tool in the kickstart phase where you can create resources in AWS in a compliant manner with security uh, integrated, with ops already integrated. So the development team doesn't have to worry about the security and the ops aspect um, near the end. We also create base Docker images, base AMIs that project teams consume to, to deploy their apps on, right? This is where we have all the compliance and standards already baked in. And we have all of our security tools and scanning tools already baked in. So when it's deployed on a VPC, we know that we are going to have all the scanning tools, all the monitoring tools running to make sure that you know, all the securities and, and, and the healthy uh, the health of the apps that we can monitor, right? And of course, once it's released, we've got tools that are continuously verifying and monitoring whether the app is healthy. All right, so you know, putting all this together, um, it, was a, it was a challenge because, again, the culture shift and culture change, that was what's important. Having all the right tools, of course, that's needed, but shifting people, shifting their mindset to follow this was really the difficult part. But throughout the last you know, three, four years, I believe we, we were successfully able to change the mindset of our folks. And, and providing the right tooling, I believe, helped a lot in, in getting there. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Chris. He's going to come up and talk about how we create our AMIs and we encrypt our AMIs and share across multiple accounts within our environment. Chris. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here with you today. Um, my name is Chris Musard. I'm a director at FINRA. I oversee the cloud engineering team. 
The cloud engineering team at FINRA is primarily responsible for the creation of AMI images, Docker images, as well as server configuration management for all of our Windows and Linux instances running in AWS. Um, so today I'll be discussing how we tackled the problem of delivering an encrypted AMI across many accounts. So if any of you have um, been presented with the need to deliver an encrypted AMI in multiple accounts, you may know that it's a little bit challenging. Uh, whereas an unencrypted AMI can simply be shared by going in the console, clicking on the permission tab, and adding a list of accounts, or a single API call can do the same, unencrypted images pose a couple of additional challenges. Um, one of those challenges is that because the images are encrypted with KMS keys, you can't use the simple sharing method that you can with an unencrypted image. Uh, an additional issue is that whereas sharing just shares centrally from one account to all the other accounts, you have to make an actual copy of the image into the target account. It can't be pushed centrally. So when we were presented with the requirement that all of our instances be running from encrypted boot volumes, we considered several solutions. And here are some of the ones that we considered. Uh, building an image in each account uh, from scratch using you know, the same build process. Using customer managed keys and some sort of cross-account key access. Um, executing a script in each account via Jenkins or some other tool, which is actually the initial approach we took. And then after some further research, we're now rolling out a solution based around Lambda using cross-account access given to the Lambda rule. So let's take a little comparison of each of these possible approaches, right? So building an image in each account, the pro is that it's probably simple and straightforward. Um, the cons are that even though if you're using all the same scripts and artifacts and build process, et cetera, because you're not doing a block level copy, there's still the potential for differences to creep in if you're building this thing over and over and over. Um, customer managed keys with uh, KMS with cross account access is somewhat similar to sharing in that you can grant cross-account access to another account to your customer managed key, but it has some downsides. Uh, the downsides are, for example, the default uh, service limit for KMS is 2,500 grants per key. And in that example, each instance which would launch from that instance would consume one of those grants. You also have to manage the addition and removal of the grant as well as key management, rotation, et cetera, for the KMS key itself. Executing a script in each account, which is what we first implemented via Jenkins with a slave that would actually spin up in every account, it does have the pro that you're doing an actual block level copy, so you can be somewhat confident in the resulting images identical across all of the accounts. But we felt that it was not very scalable um, in, in the fact that we have to create new builds and continue to set this up every time a new account had to be created. So the solution that we're implementing now is cross-account Lambda, which one, ensures the account is the same, or the image is the same in each account. It uses an AWS managed key rather than a customer managed key and AWS takes care of the grants and the rotation, et cetera. Um, it's also centralized in that you can push it from one account. So here's a quick overview of our VPC layout. So at FINRA, we use what we call the tools accounts, which are basically accounts designed to centrally house all of the core infrastructure services that the other applications need in one account so that we, don't, we aren't duplicating all of these services across a, a whole bunch of accounts. So examples would be things like Jenkins masters, um, batch schedulers, monitoring, et cetera. The tools account would also be given a service role that would have cross account access to all the other accounts in the environment. 
So how do we actually go about building our AMI? <clears throat> Using Jenkins and Packer in a dev environment, we first run a build of the image. We then launch tests, which includes things like test infra scripts, uh, sample application deployments to kind of vet out the image. And then once that's done, we share it to the tools account as well as copy the unencrypted image into the tools account. Once we have the image into the tools account, we then invoke the Lambda, which resides in the tools account, passing in target account numbers. And then using cross account access, the Lambda can execute as if it's actually running in that target account. So how does this Lambda work? Um, the first thing we do is get a local session using the BOTO uh, STS module. We get the AMI ID from the local tools account. We then have to share from the unencrypted image the AMI image as well as the underlying EBS volume so that the target account can initiate a copy against it. Once that's done, we get a cross account session so that we're now executing the Lambda as if we were in the target account and then we initiate the copy operation, specifying the encryption flags so that when it's copied into the target account, we now have an encrypted image residing there that's identical to the image it was copied from. In addition to copying the image, we also capture the AMI ID and upload it to SSM Parameter Store so that other applications can dynamically take advantage of the new AMI ID without having to make a bunch of updates every time we make an image. And with that, I will give you a quick demo um, demonstrating how this works. So here, we are in the we are in the tools account at this point. You can see the account number here, the AMI ID, and here you would see the word encrypted if it were an encrypted image. So now looking at the Lambda, uh, which also resides in the tools account. And as I mentioned, we, we've implemented this in Python. And we have a service role, which has you know, access to all of the other accounts. If we look at this test Lambda event I've set up, you can see that we're passing in the account number of a different account. And I will go ahead and execute a copy. And here we can see that the copy was initially uh, successfully kicked off. So we will now switch over to the target account. And we can see that we have a new image being copied in with a new AMI ID and a different account with encryption. we take a look at SSM Parameter Store, we can also see that the AMI ID has also been populated in Parameter Store so that other applications can consume that. 
So with that, I will hand it over to Latha, who's going to go into some more detail on the Portis and Fidelius applications. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lata. Uh, I work as lead developer at Findra. I'm very excited to be here and share with you all how we manage security groups and credentials at Findra. Let's start with uh, security group management first. As most of us might be aware of, security groups act as virtual firewall rules controlling your incoming and outgoing network traffic. This makes them an important building block in securing your applications and data on AWS. And hence, getting to manage them right from the beginning is crucial for your cloud adoption. Let's start by looking at some of the challenges we started out with, and then we will look at the solution that we came up with. The first important and the major challenge was to manage the volume of security groups. And this only increased with the number of apps moving to AWS. And getting to manage this volume without the right tooling or automation in place was not possible. The second challenge, as Daniel was mentioning, was to incorporate or embrace the mindset of embedding security into your continuous delivery pipeline right from the beginning, rather than having it as an afterthought during your product release cycle. The third challenge was we not only wanted to manage the volume of security groups, but we wanted to make sure that we manage them right by putting in some kind of a blueprint or desired architecture in place, which was based out of certain best practices for your security groups. Once we had the blueprint or the desired architecture in place, the next natural requirement was to ensure some kind of a compliance on a regular basis to make sure that the security groups created for applications actually uh, follow the desired architecture that we have. And we also wanted to have an easy trace of any changes made to the security groups. So auditability was another important requirement. From a developer's perspective, we wanted this to be more of a self-service model, where they could manage the security groups belonging to their applications on their own without having an external dependencies, but yet be compliant with the desired architecture put in place. Last but not the least, we wanted speed and agility in this entire process. So with these challenges in place, the solution that we came up with was to build a tool called Portis. So what exactly is Portis? It's, it's a web app, but it is meant more for a centralized security groups management, which can be used both by application developers as well as your SecOps admin. So application developer would use this tool to create compliant application-specific security groups. And SecOps admin would use this tool to define or put in place security policies. So we saw that the tool did improve productivity for developers, and at the same time, simplified governance and administration for SecOps admin. Let's look at some of the important features that the tool supports. So when a SecOps admin logs into this uh, POTUS app, he gets onto the administrative dashboard and defines security policies. So what exactly is a security policy? In simple terms, a security policy is a list or a collection of whitelisted inbound and outbound rules, which could be globally defined for your organization for multiple different applications. And once the uh, security policies are defined, you could, you could define a policy per logical system. So for example, you could define a policy for your database servers, or, and you could define another policy for your application servers, and another one maybe for your load balancer. And each of these policies could have whitelisted rules specific for that particular logical system. And the structure of these security policies is what determines your desired architecture. So next, when an application developer logs into the Portis app, they would go on to the Portis developer dashboard and start to create their security groups. And when they're creating the security groups, they have an option to select one of the policies that is put, put up by the SecOps admin. And the, the policy that you choose would depend on the intent of your security group. For example, me as a developer, if the intention of my security group is to be applied on a database, I would choose a database-specific policy. So once the security group is created, I can add more uh, rules to it, 
and the rules would be pretty much what has been whitelisted in the policy that I created my security group with it. So this gives flexibility to the developer to add the rules which he needs for his application, but yet they get to play only in the space which is like whitelisted for that particular policy. <clears throat> so once the um, security group is created and assuming that it's all tested in your development environment, the next natural tendency is to move the security group to a higher environment and like for example to move to QA and, and eventually to prod. So this calls for uh, uh, some kind of a promotion uh, feature. So the SecOps admin not only defines the security policies, but also puts in place some kind of a promotion pipeline. The promotion pipeline is a linear pipeline which determines how your security groups would travel around the software development lifecycle. So for example, as you can see, uh, there's a promotion pipeline defined which says that your security groups can move from a dev AWS account to a QA account and then eventually to a prod AWS account. Once the promotion pipeline is defined, the application developer would get onto Portis and create a promotion request, select the tested security groups, choose the target account, and place a promotion request. At that point, the SecOps admin can review the request and approve it, and the security groups would get copied onto the target system. So now that we have seen some of the important features, I will show you uh, these features in action. All right, so I have logged into the Portis app here as a developer. And uh, what you're seeing is the uh, security policies. As a developer, I only have a view access to the security policies. So there are multiple policies defined here for each of the logical systems. Like for example, you can see that there is an ALB policy which is meant for uh, load balancers, and then there is an ECS policy which is meant for uh, the uh, ECS cluster instances. Let's look at the ECS policy because that's pretty simple. So if you see, um, it has the um, whitelisted inbound and outbound rules. Let's look at the inbound rules. So there's only one rule that's uh, whitelisted here, which is a TCP protocol and a range of ports. And it says that it is um, AGS security group. It only allows a source from an AGS security group. What that means is an uh, inbound rule would be only allowed from another security group belonging to the same application. So you cannot have another, a different application have an inbound rule to this, but only the security groups belonging to the same application can have an inbound rule. So if you go to the outbound rules, you will see that there are certain standard um, HTTPS ports which are whitelisted. And again, it says that outbound is again within the same space of the application security group. So let's go on and create a security group. So you would typically come to the security groups page to view all your application security groups and also to create or make modifications to any of your groups. So on the top, you can see that there's a dashboard where I can select my apps. So this would be a list which the developer is entitled to. And then you can choose the account that you want to create your security group. You're typically limited to only development accounts. And then you can also choose the region where you want to create your security group, followed by the VPC that you want to create it in. So once you have your selections made, you can go ahead and create a security group. So let me select the same ECS policy. You can provide a description. And optionally, you can provide a suffix which would get appended to your uh, security group name. So what this would do is it would create an empty security group. It's pretty much a clean slate, no rules added. And now you can start adding the rules which you need for your application. So you can click on the add rule. And here, you see that I only get to choose what was whitelisted in my ECS policy. I don't see any other options, which otherwise you would have seen on an AWS console. So I can select the role. Yeah, I will keep ALB here. 
And if you see on the source, it's only listing me the security groups which belong to my application. The account also has security groups belonging to different other applications, but I am entitled to use only the security groups belonging to my application because that's how it was defined in the policy. So I can go to the outbound rules and it's again, it's gonna be very similar. I can only choose the uh, rules that were whitelisted and add them. So this would always ensure that whatever security groups you're creating is compliant with the policies put in place. Now assuming that I have it all tested on my development environment, I can go to my promote request page and create a promotion request. So here I start by choosing my target account where I want to promote the security groups to, followed by the region and the VPC. So this would list me all the security groups available in my source account, which is my uh, development account, and then I can select what I need and submit the request. All right, so I see the list here. Let me choose everything, and I can give a short description to my change, and optionally make sure that they are in fact having the right rules, and once I am fine with it, I could go ahead and create it. So at this point, it uh, creates a promotion request, which is pretty much in, your, in a draft state, and you could go ahead and make any more additional changes if you want to, or you could go ahead and if you're fine with what you have in your request, you could just go ahead and submit the request. Yeah, it's not this slow, trust me. I think it's a network problem. So once you hit the submit button, the SecOps admin gets notified that there is a promotion request available and he needs to do something about it. And typically they would uh, go over to make sure that the rules are all uh, actually in line with the policies put in place and there are no additional rules which were added. And uh, once they're happy with it, they would go ahead and approve it. So if I go to the pending uh, tab, I will see that my request is pending approval. So that's in a nutshell uh, uh, how the POTUS app uh, works. Now that we have seen the app in action, let's look at the uh, details or what's happening behind the scenes. I'll switch to the presentation now. All right. So when the user logs into the app, there is an active directory authentication that happens behind the scenes. And once the user is authenticated, the authorization service on Portus kicks in, which determines the role of the user, so which could either be a SecOps role or a developer role. And the way it is determined is based upon the active directory group that the user belongs to. And if the role is that of a developer, it goes further ahead and determines the applications that the developer has access to again based on Active Directory groups specific to the application that the user is a member of. Once the uh, authorization or entitlements are figured out, the uh, other services kick in and they are given access based upon their uh, authorization. So for example, the policy service would take care of all the CRUD operations on your uh, security policies. And then we have the security group service which manages, which actually does most of the heavy lifting and manages all your security groups on the target accounts. And underneath, it uses the AWS Java SDK to uh, make changes on the security groups. And as Chris was explaining, we have the Portus app deployed on a tools account and it is peered to all other application accounts. And it uses a, a cross account IAM role by assuming a corresponding Portus IAM role on each of the target accounts to perform the actual operations on your security groups. So you, you could have multiple application accounts connected to the uh, tools account. And then the last service is the promotion service, which takes care of, your, uh, takes care of the life cycle of your promotion requests, and also it manages the promotion pipeline. And the artifacts itself, which are produced, basically the security policies and the promotion requests and the pipelines, are stored and persisted on the Portus uh, RDS database. So that's in short how the uh, Portus architecture looks like. 
uh, let's look at what's in, uh, what's in the roadmap for the future. So what we saw in the demo was more of creating the security groups using the web interface. But we do have plans of uh, providing a way to define your security groups in code so that you define it once and you can deploy it multiple times on any uh, account or environment. We believe that this would further speed up your continuous delivery uh, pipeline. Uh, we have also seen use cases wherein um, uh, certain rules need to be whitelisted not for the entire org or not for all applications, but only for, like, say, a specific application. So this calls for app-specific security policies, and we plan to have that implemented as well. And the goal is we have all this open source by end of the year. So we highly encourage any feedback or, of course, contributions when, once we go open source. So with this, we come to the end of how security groups are managed. And we will move on to see uh, how credentials or secrets are managed at FINRA. Let's start again by looking at the challenges and then the potential solution. So the first challenge, again, is to do with the volume. We have many apps, many accounts, and the credentials that come along with them. So we need some kind of a tool or automation built to manage these credentials securely and also cater to the volume. We also wanted separation of duties, wherein we would have like an ops group taking care of staging credentials on the production environment, but the developer takes care of managing the credentials on the development environment. To support separation of duties, and we wanted to go with more like a self-service model to provide uh, a easy to use interface, which can be used by both the ops group as well as the uh, development group. Not only did we want a human interface, uh, interface which human beings can use for staging the credentials, but we also we wanted to provide uh, automation or an API to be able to grab credentials, probably by applications or clients, to be able to uh, get the credential at deploy time or at run time. So automation was definitely needed. Last but not the least, we needed a trace of any change that is made to the credential on any of the accounts or environments. So with these challenges in place, the solution that we came up with was an app called Fidelius. So Fidelius is a centralized secrets management uh, service, which helps you manage secrets across multiple environments, accounts, and for different applications. It supports two interfaces. One is the web interface, more for um, uh, the, uh, to support the um, separation of duties use case. And the other one is an SDK or CLI for automation needs. Based on these two interfaces, we have two different ways of doing authentication and authorization. The web interface approach uses the Active Directory-based authentication, very similar to what we saw with Portus. And then the uh, CLI, or the API approach, uses the AWS IAM way to do authentication and authorization. And the secrets themselves are both encrypted at rest and in transit. So some of the important features are, of course, it supports the basic CRUD operations on your secrets. And it also keeps a history of versions for all your secrets, which means whenever there's an update made, it's a new version that gets created. So each version is pretty much immutable. And it also supports separation of duties the way we saw in the challenges section. And it provides provides auditability by capturing the user or the IAM role making change to your credential, along with the timestamp at which the change was made. It comes in with a built-in cross-region replication, which is very handy when you want to do disaster recovery. And it also we also run automated backup of the entire um, encrypted set of credentials onto S3 bucket. So let's look at these features in action now. So I'm launching the Fidelis app. Something has to go wrong during the demo. Always. Let me try again. OK, looks like I'm not able to connect to the um, SSO. 
so. got a backup i had it recorded i wish i could show you live but let's okay so i'm launching the fidelius uh, app and when i log in i can choose the account followed by the region and then the application that i want to manage the credential for and optionally an environment and now i start off by creating uh, adding a credential so there are multiple components that I can fill in. Component is an optional field. This is handy if you want to um, separate your credentials based on different components in the app. Otherwise, you just give a name to your credential and put in, fill in the secret value. You could also choose the Active Directory option, in which case it would run some validations on your secret. Otherwise, it's not required. So I go to the view, and I can see that my secret was saved correctly. And if you go to the history, uh, I'll see that there was a version added for that particular credential. Now I can go to the edit screen and change my credential to add in and probably fill in a new secret value. And I'm clicking on update. It would store the new value. And if I go to the history tab, I can see that there is a new version created over there. And when I view the secret, it's going to fetch me the latest version. Yeah, and of course, if you don't need the credential anymore, it's obsolete or your app has changed, you can always go and delete it, which will completely remove it from your credential store. So that's in short how the Fidelius app looks like. Now switching back to the um, presentation, uh, let's look at what's happening behind the scenes. All right. So the architecture is pretty much very similar to what we do at on Portus. When the user logs in, an Active Directory-based authentication kicks in. This is, I'm, I'm talking about the web interface approach. Uh, once the authentication is done, the authorization service kicks in, which determines the role of the user, either to be that of the um, developer or ops. And once the entitlements are determined, the um, Fidelius service, which actually, actually does the CRUD operations on your credentials, uh, starts up and it takes care of managing your credentials on the target account. And this again is done by using cross-account IAM role. And the credential itself is stored on a Dynamo table which sits on the target account. And along with the KMS key uh, which you use for encryption is also going to be on your target account on the specific region. So this is an extension of the open source cred stash tool with FINRA specific syntax and semantics built on top of it. So that's the flow for how the web interface would work. If you're using it from a client or the API or the SDK, you would use the um, IAM uh, credentials or IAM, uh, the AWS credentials to make the uh, call to the, uh, get the credentials. Um, so we provide three flavors of SDKs predominant one being the Java SDK. You also have options for Python and uh, JavaScript. So you can use any of these SDKs to get credentials or put credentials from your application for automation needs. So that's in short how the uh, Fidelius architecture looks like. So in the future roadmap, uh, we, when we started out to um, conceptualize Fidelius, we did not have the AWS Secrets Management Service out. So we have plans of integrating that into the backend and have it open source by the um, uh, quarter three of uh, 2018. So with that, I come to the end of uh, the credential management. I will hand it over to uh, Daniel. He will walk you through the other open source offerings that we have. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Thanks, Lata. Thanks, Chris, for the walkthrough. 
So as Latha mentioned, we have Portis and Fidelius lined up to be open source this year. Uh, we have other projects that are open source already on GitHub. So if you go to technology.fina.org and go to the open source section, you're going to see all of our open source projects. The ones that are listed here are the DevOps products that we have already open source and we are planning to open source this year. So just kind of give a brief description of each of these projects. So we have a tool called Gatekeeper, which allows users to obtain temporary access to EC2 and RDS instances. We have a tool called Yum Nginx API, which is a Go API to upload RPMs to Yum server as well as manage the Yum server. And this is our latest open source project called Affilian, which monitors AWS service usage limits and visualizes that in nice graphs and tables and alerts that you're reaching the threshold. And coming soon, we have Fidelius, the app that Latha just went through, which manages secrets, and Provision, which creates resources in AWS as well as deploy your applications in AWS. Another app called CloudPass, which gives you temporary tokens to interact with AWS. And lastly, the Portis application that Latha went through that manages security groups. So I encourage everyone to go and check out our open source projects. And we're going to have more open source projects that are lined up for next year as well. So please um, wait for our announcement. And hopefully, you guys can start contributing to our open source projects as well. And that is the end of our session. Thank you very much for coming and uh, listening to our talk. We are going to be here after the session. So if you guys have any questions, we'll be happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you very much.